Hello, there we go. I have Hedge Pig voice. Hello and good evening, everyone. This is Hedgy. It is an unusual time for me to be streaming on a Saturday. It's eight o'clock Pacific time. Uh, unfortunately, it's been a very eventful uh, couple days, and um, not really going to go into it, but. Uh, Made it so that I'm streaming at an unusual time tonight. I am going to be making chicken tetrazzini, uh, which is basically a very simple casserole. You can either make it stovetop and keep it that way, or you can do the baked version, which is what I'm going to do tonight. And chicken tetrazzini uses, it's a pasta dish with lots of chicken and mushrooms and celery and uh, it usually classically has a cream sauce with it but since my mother can't do milk she's allergic to milk and the other dairy products uh, i am going to do a slightly less common version which uses chicken gravy instead and the pasta that it uses is spaghetti that's broken up into shorter lengths and it's one of my favorite casseroles, actually. Um, it's very filling. It makes a lot, It uh, especially the way I make it. And it um, it's just a lovely dish. It freezes very well, and it tastes nice and creamy and meaty and it's got some crunch in it from my t my uh, take on it which instead of putting a crumb topping on it i will put a um, shaved almonds which they don't get soggy and no matter what you do to them and they stay crunchy so that's always good plus chicken and almonds go really well together I am going to be doing this slightly out of order tonight, and in case anyone wants to follow along, uh, this recipe is up in my Discord, and it is under Stream Recipes, and you can find it there to get your ingredients. And I'm going to do it out of order. Usually the last thing you do is the pasta, but because I have one power cord, uh, I'm going to do the pasta first. So. Uh, although you don't need to see it, I mean, it's unexciting. I've got water boiling here, and to this boiling water, I am going to add uh, the spaghetti. So the first thing I do is get the spaghetti, and this calls for 12 ounces of spaghetti, which is not quite a pound. A pound is 16 ounces, and what you need to do is this is thin spaghetti which I prefer over the thick stuff for the regular spaghetti but again that's a taste thing um, I just like it better I like angel hair pasta even better but I am forbidden from ever going near angel hair pasta again after a the first time I cooked for my husband I was trying to impress him I admit it and I made a seafood carbonara uh, with angel hair pasta and the box said it it was for six to eight six to eight servings they lied that box we got so much we had so much pasta from that serving that I completely filled a salad bowl to heaping with it so what you need to do with the spaghetti here is you need to break it in half and then half again if you like it especially small, uh, which is generally my preference. And what you need to do, I don't know what is wrong with this. It's got string in it. That's different. Let me see if I can get the string out. very strange um, you break the spaghetti in half and then half again and that takes just a little bit because well it's the amount of spaghetti you need to do you could probably do it just in half and be fine I like doing it in half again because 
I like the spaghetti to be something that you can easily pick up with a fork without having to twine it, and I picked up too much, so it's not going to break. Um, and you just ah, break it with your hands and hope it doesn't whack you in the face like it just did. Uh, that was a bit of a surprise. Um, actually, I am going to take and start putting this into my baking pan I've got here so I can easily dispose of it. Get the pepper out. It doesn't need pepper. So I will start putting it in the baking dish that I'm going to use. And I got these from Costco. There was like a stack of 30 of these things for 11 bucks. And you know, you can pay a lot of money for these in, gro in grocery stores. So um, it was a deal. So we have baking dishes forever which is fortunate because I like using them. Okay, so I'm going to just continue going on this as fast as I can because now that I've taken the lid off the spaghetti, of course, it is, it is not boiling anymore. So I will start that up again. Uh, yes, I do want to be taller than the spaghetti. That's, that's always good. Smart aleck. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to keep doing this. And if you see spaghetti flying, yeah, that happens when you break spaghetti. Um, The chicken I'm choosing to use for this is my favorite, which is chicken thighs, boneless, skinless chicken thighs. The dark meat of the chicken not only contains more fat, but it also contains more flavor because in general, when you're talking about cooking, fat is flavor. Um, if you're gonna be looking for a lot of flavorful dishes, you don't look for the absolute leanest of things because the fat, converts into flavor when it's cooked and it's just it also makes the meat more moist and that's also never a bad thing um, so this is going to be using roughly eight skinless boneless chicken thighs and 16 12 to 16 ounces of spaghetti and if you want to leave it whole you can it's just I think it's a little nicer and uh, easier, especially for children to eat if they don't have to twine the spaghetti around their fork and you know have spaghetti dangling down their face and splashing sauce all over their clothing that you have to wash then. So <laughs> you're welcome, parents. Um, tastes the same. Um, it uses a lot of celery, which is also not a bad thing. Um, it makes it nice and crunchy. You could add other vegetables to it if you want. You could add uh, uh, peas would work. This uses a lot of mushrooms, and that's fine too, um, unless you hate mushrooms and you can leave them out then in that case. But it is a dish that calls for a lot of mushrooms. I'm using 16 ounces, which is a full pound. Um, and it can be the white button mushrooms, or you can use cremini. Generally, the white... <laughs> I just splashed myself in the face again with broken spaghetti. Um, generally, you use the cremini mushrooms when you want a meatier flavor to things, especially a beefy flavor. And if you're using, if you're doing vegetarian cooking, being able to get some extra meatiness into your dish is often very nice, um, especially if you're going to feed it to someone who is a carnivore like my husband. Hey, hey, cat, how are you doing? Um, thank you for joining us from your home in Montana. I hope it's not terribly snowy there and cold and nasty. And... Uh, I am making chicken tetrazzini tonight, Kat. I never actually cooked this for you when you were little, but I'm pretty sure you'd like it. It's uh, a chicken dish with 
a chicken gravy and mushrooms and celery and pasta, which you can see here. And um, it's not angel hair. It's not angel hair. I'm not allowed near that. Uh, Andrew will not let me get anywhere near that. I have tried several times, and he tells me to drop the pasta and back away. So it never even makes it into our cart, which is sad. But um, I have got to stop doing that. I'm going to put an eye out. finished with this. Yeah, it looks like a lot of pasta, but it's not really going to be. Uh, not for what I'm cooking. I'm hoping I don't need two pans of this. You need to be preheating your ovens for uh, 350 degrees to bake this. Um, and the difference between a fresh pasta dish, where you would just cook it and whenever the pasta is done, you're done with the dish, and a casserole that you cook in the oven is that you need to leave the pasta a little more than just al dente, which means a little bit. Yeah, you probably should be preheating the oven, honey. Sorry. That's on me. I forgot to tell you to do it. Um, it is something that uh, you need to have it be a little bit less than done because when it cooks in the oven, it's going to continue to cook, so you want to make sure it has that space so you don't cook it to mush. That's never pleasant for anybody. Overcooked pasta is just the worst. Okay, so I've got my pasta ready to go into the pot now, and the pot is boiling again now that I covered it up. So I will empty this all into the dish for most of it. Some of it hit the table. stir it to make sure it all goes in there and start watching the clock for the timing on this. Let me see if I can get the rest that spilled onto the table. And I'm glad you didn't have the camera view there to see me scamper that much, as much over the table as I did. And the water that I had it in, it was boiling, it was lightly salted. Um, you basically have one chance to add extra flavor to your pasta, and that is right at the beginning when you're boiling it. After you've boiled it, you can add pasta to the sauce, but it's never going to improve the flavor of the pasta itself. So you have that one chance. All right, now while that is cooking, I'm going to get started on some of the other ingredients. And so I'm going to start with the celery here. And I think Andrew pre cut it. He's cut the ends off for me. I'm going to trim a little bit more. And you could leave the uh, celery stalk whole if you want, but I like it to be a little bit smaller than that. Um, unless it's already a very small uh, stock. And this is just going to be sliced. It's not going to be uh, really reduced much in size because part of what you want in here is the texture. So we've got the te we're going to have the texture of mushrooms and celery, some onion. I'm adding some onion to this because we have onions and I like onions. So I know, don't you just hate it when someone deviates from the recipe? <laughs> now I can say uh, this, if you are gluten free, you can feel free to get gluten free pasta and put in this. And you can use a different thickener than I'm using in this, which is going to be flour. You can either get gluten free flour or you can use something like arrowroot to thicken the, the sauce. 
Um, another thing you can do is if you are on a keto diet, and I know so many people are, they can get the keto friendly uh, pastas that are made with chickpea flour and use those instead. So, and again, use a different source other than regular flour to thicken this. All right. And this is just four stalks of celery. That's, that's plenty with the amount of mushrooms and other things we're adding in here. A lot of the casseroles are inherited recipes from my grandmother. This is not one. This is one that, quite frankly, I got it from liking the uh, chicken tetrazzini that they have from Stouffer's <laughs> Frozen Dinners. And um, I just really liked it and looked up a recipe and then started monkeying with it to get my own flavors in there. Um, I add a bit more seasoning because it's just bog plain if you follow the classic recipes. It just puts salt and pepper in it. Oh! And I need to turn the heat down on that and give it another stir. Almost had the pasta boil over. That would have been bad. Now, you don't need to add oil to pasta in order to keep it from sticking to each other. Um, if you've added way too much pasta for the water, generally there's not freedom for the pasta to move around. And what really sticks the pasta together is the starch. And you need to stir while you're cooking the pasta so it doesn't adhere to each other. And then when the pasta is done, you need to not only drain it, you need to rinse it and quite thoroughly in order to get the pasta uh, starch, the, the starch off of it so it won't cling to each other and you'll just have a giant clump you can't separate. So uh, you can start by rinsing it with cold water so it arrests the cooking and then rinse it again in uh, hot water and just from the tap is fine. That'll keep your pasta warmer. So I am now going to put these into my handy dandy baking dish. I might end up needing two baking dishes. I don't know. We'll see. And move on to the onion I am uh, doing. And this is a sweet onion. And sweet onions have a pretty typical shape like this. They tend to be squat little things that are very wide, which makes them almost perfect if you're going to be slicing them for like a uh, hamburger or sandwiches. A little less easy. Uh-oh. Bad onion. Let's just throw that away. pasta again and if this was a whole pasta there's a lot of jokes about how you can tell if pasta is done one of them is taking the pasta and throwing it at your cabinet lots of fun for children to do and uh, if it's done it will stick to the cabinet um, but it will also leave a lovely snake track on your on it the easiest way is not only is the pasta ouch lids hot is the pasta flexible? Is it slightly, uh, is it, you know, changed in color? And then you taste it. And if the pasta is done, the pasta will slightly resist your tooth. This is slightly more than just resisting the tooth, so it actually needs to be drained. It is, in fact, done for 
our purposes here because it's also going to be going in the oven. I'm going to transfer this now to one of my presentation dishes because I'll be putting pasta into this. back to the other onion. You can sometimes get a pretty good deal on onions if you buy them in bulk. You can buy them in three to five pound bags. A ten pound bag is for someone that uses a lot of onions or is going to be making French onion soup, for instance. And I can guarantee if you're going to be making French onion soup that a and here comes the pasta. Let's swipe all that out of there. And and just put it back on that thing because I'll need it for gravy. Okay. All right. Thank you, honey. Now we have lovely pasta here and all right I am going to put that off onto my prep table I have on the side which is literally just that's where we pile everything that's going to be used in cooking Now, your onion, unlike the last one, should not ever have big, dark, black spots in it, um, which it did. Uh, that's a bad onion. I personally just throw the whole onion away. Um, arguably, you could, you know, use half the onion if it looks okay, but the whole taste of the onion is going to be a little off. Um, it's going to have kind of a sharp, slightly unpleasant flavor to it because it was rotting. So if you come across onions that have soft spots, if you come across onions that have dark spots and blackening in between the layers, throw the onion away. I mean, it's not like they're expensive. So anyway, so we're going to peel the onion here. I was actually planning on making um, a soup today because I really wanted soup, but I don't think anybody would be entertained if I continually made the same recipes, so I promised to make chicken tetrazzini. We're making chicken tetrazzini, and as for the recipes that have been skipped because I was sick or hurt earlier this month, or sick and hurt is more accurate. Uh, I will make those streams up at some point. I don't want you to miss the those particular recipes. They're really good. Um, all right. So I've got the little onion bits cleared off. And for dicing the onion or slicing the onion, I like to leave the root end on because it helps hold the uh, sections together which is really handy um, see it has this base area here that you can see and that actually binds the entire onion together until you start uh, slicing through it and by that time it's too late it can't get away so I just cut most of the way through this way and then flip it on its side and I cut most of the way through it with the point of the blade like this
And if anybody... Hey, Connor, how are you doing? Uh, can we get a shout out for Mr. Connor, please? Connor is a lovely young chef from England, if you don't know who he is. And he has a stream called The Only Deaf Guy. And this is really a bizarre time for you to be awake, Connor. Um, <laughs> he streams live from his cafe six days a week. And he has the only place in all of Gloucestershire that makes uh, rotisserie chicken and their chicken is plump and juicy and seasoned perfectly and just you we made a warning for uh, the stream I'm, I'm his mod and so is Andrew actually and <laughs> we made a warning for his stream not to not to watch his stream uh, without having a snack and a drink handy. So, <laughs> and it's excellent advice because if you watch his stream, you will get hungry. And by the way, Connor, that word, someone was asking how to pronounce Worcestershire sauce, Worcestershire sauce. Uh, how my area of the United States pronounces Worcestershire is Worcestershire. So it's Worcestershire sauce. <laughs> and the first time I pronounced it that way in a grocery store in front of my husband, his ears practically turned inside out and he went, Ugh! and then forbid me to pronounce it until I could pronounce it right. And I, it's still hit or miss. But uh, yeah, I don't pronounce it Worcestershire. Although I see people even on cooking shows pronounce it that way because Americans are backwards. What can I say as far as the pronunciation of some of your uh, English words? But then again, you guys hide some of your some of your letters. I mean, for instance, Leicester should not be pronounced Leicester. It should be Leicester. And if you pronounce it by the pronunciation rules. And I'm not even going to get into how Chiswick. <laughs> Well, thank you for clipping it, sweetheart. Um, <laughs> uh, Chiswick is, should be pronounced Chiswick because that's how it's spelled. And yet they don't. They pronounce it Chiswick. I learned that from Doctor Who. <laughs> uh, oh, dear. Yeah, he's got that and me singing Pink Pig. So... I'm resigned at this point that he's going to do it. All right. And I've got, I'm adding basically a sweet onion to this just because I have a bunch of them and I want to. It's not in the classic recipe, nor is it listed in the recipe that I have here. This is not a recipe that should have garlic in it. It's supposed to be a very simple, straightforward flavor. And adding garlic to it would not do that add it if you want but it's not going to be what i'm showing you <laughs> okay so i have now got this out of the way i've got the pasta i am going to take my cutting board finish cutting through that onion and that piece of onion wasn't quite cut all the way through and you can laugh at me all you want Connor if I know I cut onions really 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 uh, slow especially compared to your chef things yeah I know how much you love me You know he's going to be popping up that uh, uh, clip of me saying Worcestershire, Worcestershire, Worcestershire during your stream. I'm going to get the cutting board out of the way so that I can focus on the things that need focusing on. And that is 
my beloved electric skillet which I bring up here and it can for once be front and center I am going to unplug my hot plate and find the plug for this and get it in here so that's why you want to do this <laughs> hi cuckoo how are you doing Good evening to you. I know I'm I'm streaming at a really weird time, aren't I? Welcome into my stream. I'm making chicken tetrazzini tonight. And the next thing I'm going to do is start sautéing the vegetables. So, I am going to use... What was that? Love your less than three. Get this gold. Oh, thank you so much for... Oh my god! Thank you so much for that. Ah, that is that is amazing. Thank you so much for the donation towards our stream goal. I don't know who that was, but thank you so much. Um, that's incredible. It really is. Oh, it was Connor, huh? Thank you, honey. I really appreciate that. This is uh, probably a bit more liberal of a usage of spray oil. Uh, this is canola spray oil, by the way. Um, I find it has a lighter flavor. And um, wow, you completely knocked me off my pins with that. I've got the temperature set on this for a fairly high temperature. It's at about 300 degrees Fahrenheit. I believe that is something approaching 140, 150. I appreciate that, Connor. Thank you so, so much. Um, and what I am going to put in this to start with are the onions and the celery, which we're going to saute and get them sweated down a little bit. And what that term means as far as cooking is you cook them until they start to turn translucent. It softens them, makes them much easier to eat. Oh yeah, I'm definitely gonna need two baking pans for this. And I get out. I bet you're thinking I'm gonna say spoonchula. You're wrong. Not yet, the spoonchula has its time and its place. And right now I am gonna be, so I have got four stalks of celery in this and one sweet onion and it is in canola oil because the canola oil is a very light uh, flavored so uh, oil. It tends to just be, it doesn't add any extra flavor to it. It adds um, the ability to cook it, but unlike with olive oil where you get an olive oil flavor, in this case, oh, I love the smell of cooking onions. In this case, you just have the flavor of the food come through. My grandmother, who taught me to cook, always used exclusively corn oil. And the corn oil, what are you looking for, honey? Uh-oh. Oh, no. Okay, here. We don't have Pink Pig. Pink Pig's hiding. But here is my hedgehog hat. La, 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 la. And I will, as a matter of fact, wear it for the next 10 minutes. So you're not going to be able to see me, but I will be wearing it. <laughs> Hold on. There's no proof. Um, yeah, I'd have to stand up and bend over the table because even sitting at a chair here at this banquet table thing that we have, uh, if I did that, I'd be branding myself on the frying pan. So I don't want to do that. And I'm sad to say it would almost be branding my shoulders. So I, I, am, I am short compared to some people. 
I'm tall for a female, though. Fa la 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 hat, oh dear. Oh, husband, you're gonna, you're killing me. <laughs> I think Connor is probably up for the day. He's He's got his stream in a little while. Um, but this is incredibly early for him to be up. It's about five in the morning, I think. Half four. I am now going to tip my mushrooms in this, and I got them pre-sliced. I am that lazy at the moment, plus they were cheaper. They were actually cheaper than the whole mushrooms at this point, so I get what's cheap. And these are the cremini mushrooms, which, if you didn't know, are baby bellas. That's the uh, portobello mushroom. These are just tiny portobello mushrooms. They are exactly, if they let them grow further, they would become portobellas. And I'm going to cook these things all together for once. Um, in my directions on my Discord, it says to cook them all separately. And you can definitely do that or just save the time and cook them all together. Uh, it's very important that you actually cook the mushrooms first rather than just put them into the oven with the rest of the... Uh, casserole and mix them in raw because raw mushrooms actually contain a lot of fluid and they will release it into your casserole and make it very, very runny. <laughs> uh, yeah, I have burnt myself. I burnt myself once this stream already, and okay, I burnt myself twice this so far this stream, but not badly. It was just, you know, ouch, that's hot. <laughs> no, I didn't realize. I was busy looking at the food. <laughs> anyway, uh, I will mention it since Connor really kickstarted my my uh, stream goal up there. I do have a stream goal of raising some money to continue to improve my stream, to get more equipment, another camera, to get a microphone so I'm not using a headset that is actually a gaming headset and continues to turn itself off. Oh, it's Sunday in the UK. Well, it's Saturday here, although honestly I should have figured that out. Saturday night. Okay, I just fail at dates. <laughs> yeah, there it is, penny drops. The most important thing is, especially when you're sautéing at a higher heat like I am right now, and 300 is a pretty high heat, that's about a medium high, uh, is to keep moving your food around or you will burn it. Uh, we don't want burned food. Burned food is bad. Brown food is good. Burned food is bad. And uh, so I will just shout out and say, if you're not already following my friend Connor, you really need to. He's got the most amazing sandwich recipes and food, and he he does absolutely gorgeous chili. It's one of his favorite things to cook and one of my favorite things to watch him cook and I just drool. It looks so wonderful. But he puts garlic in it so I will never be able to eat it. <laughs> yeah, he's going to eat good tonight. Um, he usually does when I cook and the amount that I'm cooking here it will be for several nights running. Which means all he'll have to do is uh, run the microwave which makes Mr. Hedge happy. <laughs> Brie, bacon, and cranberry. Oh, take the bacon out and you'd have a happy hedgy there. I love cranberry sauce. I love brie. Combine the two on a nice roll, toast it. Oh, so good. But I have so far quite bravely held back from using that as one of my sandwich recipes because it's not my sandwich recipe. Let's see now. All right.
right, so this is going to keep cooking for a while. We've already got the pasta done. I will be, as soon as this is done, I will be adding this to the pasta and move on to cooking the chicken. And you could use a leftover chicken. Um, you could use rotisserie chicken, for instance, if you have bought a rotisserie chicken. You could buy some of those packages of frozen already diced rotisserie chicken. That's certainly a valid choice, especially if you want to toss this together really quickly. Uh, I recommend that you thaw it before you use it, but that is definitely a time saver. Um, this is just a very simple piece of, I'm going to call it Americana. I don't know which really country it was developed in, but it's just a simple casserole dish that goes really well for family nights. Serve it with a vegetable or a salad and you've got a pretty complete meal you can toss together. Uh, yeah, smoked turkey would work. I've, that's actually what my turkey bacon is, is just smoked turkey. Um, I've had a couple turkey bacon lettuce and tomato sandwiches this week and that's pretty good. And I apologize to anybody if I sound a little froggy tonight. I do to me. I don't know how I sound to you guys. Uh, I've had a fairly bad sore throat. So speaking of which, I am going to hydrate myself. Connor has posted his chili Connor carny recipe in his own Discord recipes. He's also posted it in my Discord recipes, so if you want to get it either place, you can go right ahead. Um, I know that you can get the uh, chili uh, seasoning packet that he uses from Amazon, so try to... I think you need to take a picture of that, Connor, and actually post a picture of, of, of the uh, seasoning packet so that people get the right ones. Oh, you can't? Um, hmm. I, I don't know how to help you, Cuckoo. Sorry. Um, I'm not really sure. I'm not... This is why I have a husband that's a, uh, a technical computery person. It's a fortuitous event in my life that I happen to marry someone who is very good with computers and things like this. And without him, the stream would not be possible in oh so many ways. I don't do any of the setup. I don't do any of the teardown. I just give a list and I point. And <laughs> I am one lucky gal and for so many reasons. Uh, the tech thing is just a s added side bonus, but my husband is a wonderful man. And I love him to bits, so. I highly recommend going to England for your husband. <laughs> hey, 100% of the, of the English husbands that I imported have worked out very well. So, <laughs> and all right, I am still wearing the pig hat. It is a happy little hedgehog hat and looks quite a bit like my hedgehog dread pig. Um, they use the same material to make the spiny areas. And one of these days I'll get dread pig on film. He is a very large hedge pig. He is a hedge pig of extraordinary size. I don't think that Andrew would try it. Um, he doesn't like heat of any kind in his food. And so he also would not be trying your um, jalapeno chicken because even a little bit of, of, of heat from things like that is not something he enjoys. So, well, pepper in his dinner is too hot for Andrew, so I would not count on it. Okay, I am gonna turn the heat off on this while I get it out and have it join 
the rest of my baking dish. So I have my baking dish here and I'm just going to spoon out the yumminess. And this has left some very flavorable, flavorful uh, mushroom liquor on the um, in the pan here that will add to the flavor of the chicken I will be sauteing next. When the mushrooms release their, their water, their juices, they are quite juicy and in general what you want to do is reduce that liquid if you're going to be using it. And honestly, why wouldn't you? Because that's just more flavor for your dish. If you're putting the mushrooms in there, you want the mushroom liquor too. It uh, is basically the distilled uh, taste of mushroom. And, oh, so yummy. He will eat. Um, he will eat my burritos, and he has eaten my enchiladas. But my burritos are actually a no heat thing. There's absolutely no heat in there, and my enchiladas very low heat, and they have sour cream and lots of cheese in it too, which helps cool down the small amount of heat it has. Um, but yeah, he's he's not a heat man at all. Um, He's hot enough on his own. Ha ha! Don't want any of this burning, so I'm making sure I get it all out. Because a little bit of a burned thing will spoil your entire pot. Okay. For those of you wanting to keep track, the uh, pasta and those vegetables alone have filled the first cooking dish. So it's going to definitely need to be split into two once I add a whole bunch of chicken and gravy to it. Alright. Now, I am going to add some more of the cooking spray, the oil, because the oil has pretty much been used up and now it's going to have chicken in here. And my chicken is still in frozen form, so it's going to take a little bit to saute it here. All right. I'm going to turn the heat up to, again, about between 270 and 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah. Yum, yum. So I've got some lovely frozen boneless, skinless chicken thighs that are absolutely enormous. My family is filled with carnivore. Ooh, that's a strange looking one. It's got an add-on. And these are quite thick. Uh, normally you'd be cooking these about eight minutes a side. We might have to cook it a little bit longer than that. That's fine. And now, because I just handled raw chicken, I'm going to reach up here and get some of my hand sanitizer carefully because <laughs> I had to reach around and get my neck very close to that pan and I really don't want to brand my neck. So my hands are now clean, and I'm going to hike the heat a little bit, and Silvery Frost, you are always here. Hi Silvery Frost, how are you doing tonight? Welcome in. I am making chicken tetrazzini tonight. 
and the recipe is posted in my discord please give silvery frost a shout out honey uh, he is a streamer of the long dark and i think some other games as well um, For those of you that don't know, at the moment, I am wearing a hedgehog hat. Hedgehog hat! Yay! Hedgehog hat! Almost put it on backwards. It's not our fault Pink Pig is hiding from us when you redeemed the Pink Pig, but uh, I tried to make that up, so, and I just contaminated my hand again. Oh, you're welcome, Silvery Frost. Silvery Frost is another of the uh, Long Dark Communities. Uh, chefs and cooks and rampant foodies because if you're not already a professional chef or cook you're definitely a foodie if you're in that community we all love our food we all love our recipes half the time we're talking about how to get through the next section of the game and the other half we're talking about the thing we just cooked or the thing we want to cook and <laughs> gloves <laughs> Yeah, I know you're joking. And the only time I wear gloves is if I'm handling pork. So, that's not often. I hope that everybody here had a nice holiday, that they had a good Christmas or whatever winter type holiday they celebrate. And I hope they had lots of fun and good time off. I know that so much of the communities around everywhere are sick. Um, one of my nieces is, has just gone back to school at Washington State University. And she said that in her economics class, three quarters of the class is just sitting there coughing. And they're all wearing masks, but they're all sick. And she's a little worried about she doesn't want to get COVID again. And... Uh, yeah, everybody's sick. The streamers are sick. The viewers are sick. Everybody's sick. Um, upcoming streams while I'm waiting for this to cook. Upcoming streams, I will be making a salmon dish that is made. It's a creamed salmon dish. It's made with a rosy cream sauce. And you'll have to wait and hear what that is. And that will be served with pasta. It gets classically from what my grandmother made it, which is her classic recipe. She used canned salmon. And it was the nasty stuff, which was... No, rose as in it has a little bit of a tomato product in it. So it's kind of a blushed uh, cream sauce. It's yummy. Um... She used a 15-ounce can of skin-on, bone-in salmon, and you had to pick all that apart. And it uh, would then be joined with a cream sauce and flaked up and put over toast. It was one of my grandfather's favorite dishes. And uh, I always loved it, too, because I love salmon. And I made it for my husband when we were first married and moved down to Oregon. And... We used to eat it over poached eggs on toast, and that was especially fabulous because the yolk from the eggs would mix in with the sauce and the salmon and just be extra rich and savory and just yum. So uh, I took and have adapted that to make it a pasta dish this time, and I'm using uh, frozen fillets instead of a canned salmon so that's especially nice 
And let's see. Are you going to be with me for the whole stream today, Connor? Since you're not working today? <laughs> you have the day off. The one day a week. And that's not ready to flip yet. I didn't think it would be. Let me see if I can pry this apart. I'm not really sure what this... Oh, I see. It's just kind of buckled up on itself. And I'm going to slowly pry it off. You'll try it. Well, if you go silent, I'll know you fell asleep like I often do during your streams. <sighs> Saving the stems from the herb I cut and have been leaching out some of the oils for them for bath products. Oh, that's interesting. Um, you're just adding them in. You're making your own, I don't know, soaps or something like that. Oh, yeah, rosemary's lovely for things like that. So is lemongrass. Um, I used to pay a pretty penny for a very expensive uh, hand and body lotion that had uh, lemongrass in it and it was always such a nice clean fragrance and it was just really super moisturizing too so you just need to make sure you don't use those uh, rosemary products if you're going to go out and go sunbathing because you know you get a little burn on you there and you start to smell like a roast dinner <laughs> there was a comedy uh, episode once upon a time where a guy went up on the roof of his apartment building and he was sunbathing but he didn't have any oil and didn't have any lotion to put on, so instead he used butter. And he uh, he basically basted himself in butter and got a very, very dark tan, and everybody thought he smelled like a roast turkey. So <laughs> um, that's always a good that's always a good goal. Um, anything you can do that. Uh, improves your health is, is awesome and in a lot of cases that means going with a more natural product over a more processed one be that um, in a food or you know in a health product so And this is coming along slowly. <laughs> That's fine. It's just a very, very frozen chicken product. So I'm going to turn the heat up a little bit more. And I will be doing a stream at some point. Uh, it was supposed to be this last Tuesday, but I just wasn't up to it of uh, making pizza from scratch. You know, take and make a pizza sauce from tomato sauce, plain tomato sauce, and I will make dough, which is a no-need dough. Yeah, 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 frozen chicken, not fresh. I take my shortcuts, and frozen chicken is much cheaper than fresh chicken, so... can buy it a six pound bag of uh, frozen chicken thighs that have no bone in them no skin in them and that cost me about 15 bucks versus um, you can pay eleven dollars for a whole chicken and I'd rather have a whole bunch of chicken thighs than a couple chickens um, Oh, you made a chicken roulade last night with spinach and mozzarella cheese and bacon. Ooh, that sounds good, Silvery Frost. Um, for anybody who doesn't know what a roulade is, that's basically a fancy word for a rolled chicken or a rolled product. You can make it with chicken, you can do it with fish, you can do it with beef. Probably can do it with pork, too. 
and what you would do is flatten that meat out uh, with a hammer uh, so like for in chicken in particular you generally do it out of breasts and chicken breasts are not flat things one area of it is much plumper than the other so you pound that down till it's the same thickness all the way across so it cooks evenly and then you would uh, spread the cheese and the bacon which should be pre-cooked uh, and the spinach across it and then you roll it up like a sleeping bag and uh, tie some cooking string around it and then you brown around the outside and toss it in the oven to finish baking and it makes a very very tasty dish which looks absolutely gorgeous when you slice it and it is of course also very tasty so there's much yumminess in that Did you cook just enough for you, or do you have leftover silvery frost? I think I'm going to ask the chefs here. It's an opinion thing. Actually, honey, can you throw up a, uh, can you, uh, throw up a poll over whether people feel that, uh, meat dishes, you know, if you have a steak or chicken or, you know, a roulade or anything like that, does, does your dinner need sauce to be complete? So if you can put that poll up there, it's just be an interesting one. I'm afraid this is going to be a little boring till I can get the chicken cooked. <laughs> um. There we go. Does a meal need a sauce to be complete? <laughs> Please weigh in on that and uh, we'll see what we think. I know that... Uh, a lot of the official chefs you see on TV and uh, Gordon Ramsay for one and several others they're always saying oh no sauce with this you didn't put the sauce on it and I my personal opinion is some things need sauce but not everything so Pick a battle line. <laughs> I mean, a gravy is obviously a sauce, and then they have, uh, there's a variety of different sauces that go with things. Hollandaise is especially yummy. <sighs> so I've got two votes there. Oh look, now we have three. It's almost like I just voted myself. Huh. Basically, I don't think in order to eat a steak and enjoy it, you have to have uh, au jus. I don't believe you have to have gravy with it. I think if you properly season and prepare a steak, it's good by itself. Um, adding flavors of sauces to it can just increase the complexity of the dish, but I don't necessarily think better, just different. Um, but there are definitely some dishes that need to have a sauce to be complete, like Eggs Benedict. You're not going to have a complete dish unless you have that hollandaise sauce on it. So in that case, definitely yes. Okay. This is taking forever to cook. I've got some really thick chunks of chicken here. 
and despite sitting out for an hour, that was nowhere near long enough to thaw. Okay. So I have three people voting, and I have a yes, a no, and a what. <laughs> Hello, love my toe, and welcome in. You're watching me make uh, chicken tetrazzini, which is a baked pasta casserole with chicken and mushrooms and celery. And instead of putting a crumb topping on it, I use almonds because they never they never get wet. Plus, you know, especially for people that are on a keto diet or something like that, it's also a, yet another way it's not a carb. So it's just adding more protein in. Plus, chicken and almonds really go together well. They just do. So, and if anyone has tried my almond chicken recipe, they know I speak the truth. Yep, about half my viewers are from Connor's stream, and the other half my viewers are from the Long Dark community. Love you both. Those are both great communities. Uh, rampant foodies and chefs in both. So, it's a lovely way to spend a Saturday night if you are uh, in the United States or Canada. And a lovely way to spend a very early Sunday morning if you are in the UK. I am going to separate that out if I can because it needs to cook separately. There we go. I need to be able to tip that onto its little side. And that, if you can see that, that deep pink area that says the chicken is raw inside totally utterly raw so I'm gonna flip that again the other pieces are a little flatter they're starting they're thawed out now all the way through so it shouldn't take much longer to get these cooked you don't want to put this in even though you're going to continue to cook this in the oven you want to start out with cooked chicken because you can't, you don't want to take the chance that any of your chicken that you're going to put in there is not going to come out done. Um, that just leads to food poisoning and sickness, and that would just be bad. Okay. Poll has ended with 33% yes, 33% no, and 33% what? <laughs> That was nice and decisive. So, uh, I will be doing a pizza stream hopefully soon. I will also be doing a stream for uh, the salmon that I mentioned. And We've got some interesting things upcoming. I am going to make a cottage pie this coming Tuesday. <laughs> it's not so much confusing, honey, as uh, uh, indecisive, I think it is. We, we didn't have enough of a poll to uh, enough of a viewership in, uh, today in order to get a decisiveness. So there's no resolution to it. It's just... We all have our own opinions. One of the things we need to do with this is to put some sage in it. And I'm using some rubbed sage. And I call for about a half a teaspoon to, for the entire dish. And so I am putting about a quarter teaspoon on top of my chicken. And I will be adding the rest of it into the gravy.
Yay! One more time I have managed to confuse my husband. I think I'm going to see whether or not my husband wants to take him now that the chicken is actually thawed if he will want to go dice it for me so that we can move the stream along a little bit more. I heard a sigh. <laughs> and I don't have tongs, so I'm going to use the big fork he gave me. That's definitely still raw inside, so. Okay, let me see now. Uh, you want that? Do you want the knife too? Okay. So this is gonna make a nice gravy base here. It's got chick cooking chicken juices. It's got this, the uh, juice from the mushrooms and onions and I will have more chicken in it in a few minutes because my husband's gonna bring back the unfinished uncooked chicken and I'm gonna finish cooking it chopped up uh, cubes please not now 805, you could be the tiebreaker. What's the vote? The vote, that first of all, welcome in. Thank you for your viewership. And um, the vote was, does a meal have to have a sauce in it in order to be a complete meal? And this is like, if you cook your steak, does a steak have to have a sauce? Does a chicken have to have a so sauce, etc., in order to be considered a complete meal? So what do you think? Yes or no? Yay! No has won. <laughs> I like you. <laughs> I was the one that voted no. <laughs> so you have now made it so that I have won, and that is good. Um, for if you are a first-time viewer as well as a first-time chatter, you can find my discord here and you can join my discord hey mph welcome in uh you can find my discord there to join and i have posted all of my screen rest all of my stream recipes and i have shots of everything i've cooked so you can see what it looks like as well and Welcome in, welcome in, MPH. I'm so glad you were able to make it. Not a usual time for me to stream, and I probably will not be streaming this time regularly. <laughs> Hi! <laughs> uh, I am making chicken tetrazzini tonight, MPH. I know you know what that is. Probably cooked it at your cafe. MPH is another professional chef, and he's got a place that he does his cooking out of, and food. You had a rough week, it's understandable. <laughs> that was Silvery Frost uh, giving 
me a subscription. Thank you so much, Silvery Frost, for the sub, and thank you so much to my new Not Now uh, follower. So thank you very much, and I hope you do not hear the thumping and pounding from the our upstairs neighbor who has apparently woken up now at almost half nine at night and is starting to do their tumbling runs. Uh, I am going to... This is still maintaining its heat. I've got my electric frying pan set at uh, 300 degrees. So it's a rather high heat and it is going to finish the chicken. where it will very soon be joining it a nice bath of gravy and rejoining all of the vegetables and pasta I've already got ready. Mm. I wasn't just eating a mushroom. I wasn't. Mm -mm. Okay, I was. <laughs> Mushrooms are one of my very favorite things, and it's just a temptation if they're just sitting there staring at me, and they are. They have eyes. They're watching me. I'm delicious. I'm delicious. Come and eat me. Okay. Go ahead and dump it in. Huzzah. And now I have the raw chicken bits in here with the cooked, semi-cooked chicken bits, and this will get finished much quicker. So, to the shock of no one, by the time I added my pasta and my vegetables to my cooking dish here, or my baking dish that I'm going to bake this in, it's full. So that's why I have split this into two baking dishes. I did say it would make a lot, and I was not kidding. I don't know how to cook for less than probably eight to ten. It's a weakness. My grandmother always made enough, not just for dinner, but for leftovers as well. And she was cooking, during the time that she was teaching me to cook, she was cooking for a family of, let's see, six. And, you know, then she'd have me and my brother come over and during the summer, and so then it would be eight. So they were always pretty big dishes. And I just, I was used to cooking for, you know, 16 to 24 by the time we're done with that. Uh, to make sure that we all had leftovers, and that was just the way it was. So, I guess I just figured that's the way you're supposed to cook. And uh, it's kept my freezer nice and full during most of the time, so that's always good. That is a lovely recipe. You'll love it. It's It's this creamy um, chicken gravy over the pasta with chicken and mushrooms and I put uh, shaved almonds on top or sliced almonds and makes it nice and crunchy and almonds go so good with chicken it really does Honey, I actually gave you the raw chicken so that the chicken would cook faster since I've been cooking a chicken for a really long time and it's still raw. I swear sometimes it has its own mind. Sometimes it takes eight minutes to cook and sometimes it takes 28. So, you don't believe me? Okay. Do you believe that I, I had to eat that piece of mushroom? Because I did. It was asking for it. Okay, at this point, I'm going to add a little touch of sea salt to this. 
I will pepper individual portions because my husband does not like pepper. And you know, actually, after having 12 years of not eating pepper, I have to admit I can taste pepper now and it does have kind of a strange taste at times. I don't agree it's hot, but I will never understand how a man who says he doesn't like hot foods and doesn't want to eat pepper will eat pepperoni because pepperoni is a pepper sausage. <laughs> Hurry up and cook, darn it. So as I said, upcoming this Tuesday, I will be making a cottage pie, which is, um, most Americans would call it a shepherd's pie, and it is not. Uh, a shepherd's pie is made with lamb and a couple of different kinds of vegetables and a nice gravy. And then you put mashed potatoes over the top and, and cook it in the oven for a little bit. And that is a shepherd's pie. A cottage pie is made with beef. So I am going to be doing the beef version as a cottage pie on Tuesday. And I may even be making my own mashed potatoes for the first time in 12 years because the first time I made them for him, my husband, I used instant potatoes instant potatoes and that was just bad but because we were newly married and he loved me he ate them anyway but he also said I was never making mashed potatoes again so he's taken over and he makes wonderful mashed potatoes I am probably going to be attempting to make them in front of other people just so that I can show you how to make mashed potatoes I don't think it's a complicated thing, but there's lots of things I don't think are complicated and other people do. So, for instance, if you've never made your own mashed potatoes, um, it's good to know how. So, we will go with that. This chicken is cooking quite quickly now that it's in little pieces and thawed. And I will get this going and make the gravy for it so we can poke it into the oven. Get the top toasted and the casseroles good and bubbly. Now, as I said, this will feed a lot of people. You'll have lots of leftovers. Ouch. Rack up another burn, honey. <sighs> Moving back from the table. I'm going to move that so that I can separate into two different pans. This, by the way, if nobody knows what it is, is called a pasta fork. And this is what you use to lift up things like spaghetti and, you know, keep it all in the same, uh, keep it all in the same scoop instead of just having it slide right out.
and I'm just loosening the pasta up a little bit. It's still warm, but it has chilled a little bit and it's gotten a little sticky because of that. And I am just dividing the two containers and sort of mixing them together, which is something I didn't do because I didn't really have the space in the container before. So. definitely has more pasta in it than the other one. All right. Okay. Now I'm going to grab some paper towels and wash my hands again. Let's see. Thank you, MPH. That's very helpful. Actually, I never knew what that was for. I just knew that the little fork hands uh, worked very well for uh, keeping the pasta that I wanted caged and not running out like almost any other implement you could use. I have another one that doesn't have that in the middle of it. It looks like this. And that just lets it drain. It's also a little more flimsy in the piece that it's got. So... Uh, in its handle, so I don't like to use it because it bends almost double when I've got a whole serving of spaghetti, you know, scooped on it. Okay. And the chicken is done now, so I'm going to turn the heat off here for a moment. And get my scoop. And start scooping chicken into my casserole dishes. So I've got adding the chicken over the top of this, showing you carefully so I don't burn myself. That's a good half of the chicken there. And now I'm adding this. Once again, sorry, you can't see what I'm doing. I'm not sure if it's really important that you see this part, but just ladling the chicken on top of the combination of onions and celery and mushrooms and uh, spaghetti that I have broken into four sections. All right, so I've got that down here, and the next thing we're going to do is take this and combine it with higher heat again. And I'm going to reach through here and get my chicken broth. And the next thing we're going to do is make some chicken gravy. And you do that with chicken broth. being especially lazy this season because I finally managed to find a broth in a store commercially that does not have garlic in it. So instead of making my own, I have cheated and I am using a broth made by uh, another company. <laughs> so what you need to do is put your broth into your container here and you're both deglazing your uh, frying pan with the broth, which means basically you're putting a liquid into it. It can be broth, it could be wine, if you're talking about the glazing. And you're putting it on there at heat, and then you're going to use a spoon or something similar to 
scrape up any brown bits on the bottom because those brown bits are flavor. And we definitely want to add the flavor to the broth, which will become gravy once I add flour to it. So when you have the heat turned up and you have got the broth in here, you want to run your spoon all over the areas that you were cooking the chicken on and get up any brownie bits that are sticking to the bottom. And they do, even in a non-stick container like this. Uh, they don't stick on hard, but that just makes it easier. Because um, those brown bits make flavor. It adds a, a really nice depth to what it is you are cooking. So, what you then want to do I'm going to violate a few rules here. I feel bad. I've had my husband get up and down and up and down and up and down. As I should. I need a plastic container that is like one of those oblong ones. That works. And I need you to put about a cup of water in it. And I've got flour. And what you do is you make kind of a slurry out of flour and water in equal parts that you will then add to your simmering broth when it reaches a simmer. Whisking madly so what you, do, that what you don't make is uh, basically fluffy little bits of dough instead of a gravy, a nice smooth gravy. Um, if you use really cold water and it's in the hot and it shocks it, you'll end up with um, big clumps. You can get it out with a uh, mixer, um, a hand blender or you could put it in an actual blender. The hand blender is a lot easier. If you do get lumps, you can strain them out too, but why? If you catch them early, you can blend them up and they just become part of the gravy and they're nice and smooth, so no reason. And uh, I am going to add the rest of my sage to this. I'm kind of a sage monster. I do love a lot of sage. So this is going to add in about another quarter teaspoon to make the half teaspoon of sage. I keep thinking I hear him right behind me and so I keep turning and looking. <laughs> I will also be adding a, thank you, honey. You don't want this? Okay. I will also be adding about a tablespoon of parsley. So I've got my flour. I am combining it with my water. to add my parsley to this before I go on. And a tablespoon makes a nice little pile in the middle of your hand. In my hand, it's about this much. But it's a decent amount. Um, parsley adds iron to your food. It also adds a pretty appearance, and it also adds a nice flavor. 
So I've got flour and water in a dish here and I am whisking it up together so that I get out any pre-clumps. At least that's the idea. So you, woo! <laughs> I should be wearing my apron, but I'm not. I am gonna whisk up all that I can of the little lumpies out of it so that I don't go into this with a lot of lumps. Some people have a gravy shaker which is basically just a big cup with a lid and it has a blade in it that as you shake it it mixes it up without lumps. All right I have got that smooth now and I'm going to go into stirring this up. This is heating up. All of it is now uh, steaming, which at the point that your broth is steaming is a pretty good time to add your flour and water. And it is another one of those times when you want to continuously whisk while you're doing it so you don't end up with lumps because as the cooler liquid with the flour, ouch, flour in it hits the hot broth, uh, it will start cooking that flour. And um, yeah, it makes lumps. So continue to whisk. And now that it is pretty much combined, you see how white it is? That's because the flour is raw. You can tell when the flour is cooked because this will turn a different color. It will turn brownish and it will be nice and yummy at that point. Yeah, let's see. It doesn't really take too long. You wanna make sure that this is a fairly thick um, gravy, um, not not like as thick as a milkshake, but you do definitely want to have it be uh, thick enough to not be watery when you are going to be eating it. Nobody likes that. Uh, things with a sauce in it, the, the cream sauces, the gravies, things like that, really should be a nice creamy thickness that should be uh, able to coat the back of a spoon. And I will demonstrate that when it... Uh, is that thick. I'm gonna turn the heat up a little bit. I've got it now on about 320, which is a solid medium high. And I can smell the mushrooms in this and I can smell the chicken in it definitely. You can smell the herbaceousness of the uh, parsley. And trust me, it's not going to look like a green slime when it's done. It really won't. The uh, parsley and the herbs will go through the gravy instead of all floating on top of it. So it'll look a lot nicer when it's, when it's done. And then I will be pouring it on top of my pasta. And... Well, let's see. Kind Al cheered 50 biddies. Thank you so much, Kind Al. Welcome in. You're sort of towards the end of my stream. I'm almost at the point these bad boys are going to go into the oven. Um, feel free to watch the VOD later to see the entire stream. That's very kind of you, Kind Al. You're off for the night, but wanted to say hello. Well, definitely hello, Al. Thank you for dropping in, and I will see you tomorrow, I'm sure, in some long, dark stream. Possibly several. <laughs> Thank you again for the biddies. That's very kind of you. And while this is cooking down, I'm going to take a moment and 
combine the pasta and the, con the ingredients together a little bit better of a mix than what I have them at right now. I probably could get away with doing this in one container, but if I did that, the gravy would get all over. All right. So once again, if, you ha if you're viewing and you haven't already hit follow, give me a follow if you like what I'm doing, want to give me a little encouragement to keep doing my streams. Show me you love me. <laughs> And uh, if you have already followed, again, thank you so much for your support. I appreciate every single one of you. And it makes me feel better to know I'm not sitting here talking to myself. <laughs> All right. So another thing you want to do when you're making a gravy or something, don't leave it alone for too long because it will burn to the bottom, especially if you're using a higher heat. This is now coming up to a simmer, which is what I want it to do. It is starting to thicken. And the color is turning from a white color to sort of a beigey color, which is about the best you can hope for in a, in a uh, chicken broth. And it's already thickening up quite nicely. Not quite to where I want it yet. And the test for that, I mentioned, it has to coat the back of a spoon. And for that, what you do is you take a spoon and you dip it in your gravy and turn it over. And you can see it really out. And that's time five. It doesn't actually coat the spoon it's just you can see right through it and you don't want that Ooh, that tastes nice though um, put the top back on my flour And as you can see, it's actually boiling now, which is something else I want it to do. I am going to turn the heat down a smidgen so nothing burns. But as you can see, the gravy now is the, f the herbs are s have sunk into it because there's a thickness that uh, will hold them apart and it's not just going to float on the top. So I'm getting close to the doneness of the gravy. And the amount of flour that you need for to make a gravy the right thickness, you, you do reach a finite ability of that, of that flour to thicken things. So if you're making a small amount, you know, a quarter cup or a half a cup of flour, but if you're making a large amount, and this has uh, 48 ounces of fluid in it, might not need all of it for my recipe, but uh, it's never a bad thing to have extra gravy laying around the house. Um, you need definitely at least a cup of flour. And that's a cup of flour and a cup of water. You do it in equal measure. Good night, love my toe. I appreciate you coming. I know it's really late for some of you and really, really early for others. So I appreciate your viewership. I appreciate your hellos. And uh, very soon I will be poking these into the oven. Or actually my husband will be. And they need about 20 minutes then. So... I will show you what it looks like. Uh, you won't see the absolute finished version unless we just want to hang around and talk for 20 minutes. And this oven has been preheating this entire time uh, at 350 degrees in the background. That's a nice warm oven, not particularly hot. You're not going to really burn things. Could even do up to 375 if your oven runs a little cool. 
but all we're really trying to do is add a little bit of toast on the top and finish cooking the pasta in the gravy so it absorbs some of the flavor, which it will do. Um, my recommendation is that you make it a little runnier than what you want to see your casserole at because the pasta will suck in a lot of that liquid. It will suck it in while it's cooking and once you refrigerate it, it will really start putting it away. So make it a little extra runny and uh, you won't regret it. Still a little runnier than I'm happy with. But I will once again put my spoon in here and you can see now you don't see completely through the gravy. You don't you it's coating the spoon basically. And then you run your finger through it like that. And you can see the difference. That is actually a fairly decent thickness. That is a Again, a fairly decent flavor too. Um, I'm gonna let it get a little bit thicker than this, but not a lot. So, at this point, what we want to do is take this aside and get my scoop because I am going to start filling my casseroles, which as you see, I have combined all of the ingredients together, except for the gravy. And I am now going to ladle the sauce onto it. Can you open the uh, almonds for me, honey? They're there on the arm of the chair. Now this sauce would classically, after you made the gravy, you would be putting, after you made the broth and all, you would be putting a white sauce into this, which would combine in sort of a cream of chicken kind of thing. Uh, but because my mother can't have dairy products. I am doing it without that. And Thank you, honey. Okay, so you want to be able to see the gravy on top like this. You've got enough gravy in there. And then what you want to do is take some of these uh, sliced almonds and you want to sprinkle them lightly over the top. These will toast in the oven a little bit and they will get extra crunchy and they just make a lovely topping for this particular casserole. So it looks like this when you're done. And my husband can take that away and put it into the oven while I get the second one ready. That's 20, ooh, 20 minutes, honey. Now, if you choose to make this as the stovetop variety, I mentioned it doesn't actually have to be cooked in the oven. You can make it, um, just cook the pasta completely to al dente and not to the little bit beyond al dente I did here uh, because I knew I was going to be putting this in the oven. And at the point that you put the gravy on it and you put the uh, almonds on it, you can just mix it through real good and serve it right away. Uh, but if you want to have the casserole baked in the oven, that's when you undercook the pasta a bit. Also, if you're cooking this to freeze, you would also want to undercook the pasta because when you microwave it, you are, of course, also cooking it again. 
Um, got I have almost got all of the gravy in this now and again you want to make this saucy enough that it's not going to dry out um, dry gravy uh, dry pasta is just sad and if you do happen to, this doesn't happen to have enough gravy in it or you like it a little bit moister when you're doing the reheating, you can add some more gravy that you make real quick or you can use a poultry gravy mix and add it into it. It'll be much saltier, but you will have um, the flavor you're looking for and the moistness in the pasta. So nothing wrong with that. There's also canned gravies you can use that are fairly decent. Obviously your homemade is much better. Alright, so I have got this one nice and saucy and I'm gonna finish topping that with almonds. And this will go in the oven with its twin. Now at this point, if you were making it for a family of four or something like this, you could take your uh, container that you've got here, your, your baking container that's the uh, uh, disposable ones, and you could wrap the top. That look yummy. And you could wrap the top of that with uh, aluminum foil and put it in the freezer. And when you want to use it later, you put it out on the uh, counter to warm up. Cook it for 45 minutes at 350 when it's thawed. And I'm just going to give it to you. It's just... Okay. So we go to uh, 45 minutes if it's thawed. If it's not thawed, you're looking at probably an hour and 45 minutes. So if you're cooking it from frozen, uh, about an hour and 45 minutes will get it cooked. And once again, because this is a completely cooked recipe, everything in it now is actually cooked through. Um, it's a lot safer to eat it then. You, uh, you can do spend your time while it's cooking in the oven and you can make yourself a side salad if you want get yourself a nice bag of salad and dice up some uh, tomato and maybe some cheese or whatever else little nibblies you want to put on it maybe whisk together a uh, homemade vinaigrette with some oil and vinegar salt and pepper um, maybe some onion if you want to have a nice Italian flavor to it add some oregano and basil and you know maybe add in a little bit of Dijon mustard yes I know honey you don't like salad and then whisk that until the oil emulsifies and you've got yourself a nice little fresh dressing and serving that with the pasta dish will give you a nice complete meal and this is also something that you could make a couple trays of this like I just did and bring it along to a potluck. Um, very easy for that. Fairly economical. I mean, that was the basic appeal of casseroles. They were easy to put together. They were most often made with leftovers and they were very economical. So there's lots of recipes like that came about in the 40s because the country was at war and there were all kinds of economic impacts on that and people needed to stretch their food stretch their protein they protein was being rationed for the troops and so people started throwing dishes together with 
a little bit of protein and adding in vegetables and pasta excuse me pasta or rice or you know bread cubes for making a, a, a stuffing type casserole and that way then they could feed their entire family with you know a pound of meat instead of you know having it be gone and it would last several days sometimes instead of you know, you know just one meal so that's kind of the economics behind the casserole not to mention they're just easy to prepare um, you do the preparations you have them it's complete it's there you toss it in the oven and it's done while you're you know, checking to see if your kids have done their homework or you know sitting down and relaxing after you've gotten home from work that's also the appeal of the crock pot which you can chop some food up real quick and toss it together throw it in the crock pot and have it cook all day and when you come home dinner's ready <laughs> so there's definite appeal to that I think everybody can if you don't have a dedicated uh, stay-at-home person in your life who does your cooking for you uh, things like casseroles are really simple and especially in these days where we can't really afford to throw things away that's it gives you things to do with you know the vegetables and your leftover meats and your other leftovers to make it into a meal so that you may have a chicken and you start out with that for one meal or a turkey and then you know the next night you make a casserole that feeds you for another couple nights or an, a night and a lunch so those are some lovely things now if anybody has anything they'd like to see me cook you can go to my discord and there are stream suggestions also if you have any other suggestions other than good god hedgy get another camera so that we can see your face <laughs> um, put that in stream suggestions too if you want to see me demonstrate a particular thing I've been requested for my chicken mushroom chowder I was supposed to cook that uh, earlier didn't because I was sick I will get to that because that's such a fabulous recipe and I was requested to make eggnog from scratch because uh, with bad weather and some of the things going on you know people couldn't find eggnog in the recipe in the grocery stores when they wanted to get it so I showed people how to make two different eggnogs both a cooked version and a raw version and so you know they got to have their eggnog when they wanted it uh, and weren't dependent on the store to have a pre-packaged pre-made version for them um, some other recipes I am going to be making cod chowder for people uh, on stream and that is going to be made with a nice big chunks of cod and potatoes some carrot some onion some celery and a nice rich uh, white sauce with in, in it to thicken it which makes it the chowder and gonna have some uh, bake and go rolls with it the kind you buy in the store that are pretty much semi baked they've risen they've they've just started to be cooked and then you throw them in your oven and you finish them so that they're nice toasty fresh rolls and that always goes good with soup um, I am also going to be having a breakfast for dinner stream where I'm showing you how to make another baked omelet and probably some other dishes uh, I haven't come up with all of them yet. I'm thinking possibly a, uh, well, we, they call it a stuffed French toast, but really what it is is a bread pudding that is made uh, sweeter for breakfast things. You could make them savory as well, but I have a recipe that is uh, called blueberry pie or uh, blueberry cream. Uh, cheesecake uh, 
stuffed French toast, and that's interesting. It uses uh, blueberries and cream cheese, and it uses a fresh made uh, blueberry sauce to put over the top of it after you bake it. And that is another good thing to do with stale bread, is um, bread pudding. And traditionally that's made with a custard sauce, which is eggs and cream and some sugar and vanilla and usually some seasonings that you put over um, big bread cubes and you put in some raisins and some walnuts if you like and throw it in the oven and you bake it and it comes out and it's ooey and lovely and tasty and it gives you another thing you can do with uh, bread that's going off. You don't want to use it anymore for a salad or for uh, a sandwich or something like that, then uh, you can take and turn it into this bread pudding or you could even toast it in your oven and turn it into croutons for your salad or for making uh, stuffing with. I started writing my cookbook and it was to save the memories of the family who are gone, their recipes, stories of the times we had together. And I've always said that food is kind of a magic. Through food, you can show your love to people. You can show them that you care about them. And you know, when grandma made your favorite recipes, when she cooked for you, she was cooking with love and she was showing her love of you. And when they're gone, you can bring back those times. You can remember that person and remember all those lovely times you had with them by cooking the food that they cooked and tasting it again. You know, sending it on to your uh, family below, if it's your children, your grandchildren, your nieces and nephews, your friends. You can share your memories through the food of the people that you loved. And it helps bring them back. And unfortunately, we've lost a lot of my family who never passed on their recipes. I have my grandmother Twitchell's recipes because she taught me to cook. And unfortunately, there's so many people now who are gone who didn't share their recipes. And we lost another family member yesterday afternoon. And he's someone I mention in my in my recipe book as being my sister-in-law's father and the memory I have of him most clearly is I was living with my oldest brother and sister-in-law and their two children and it was Christmas time and it was the first time I had been a away from home away from my parents away from my childhood home at Christmas and because I was working on a work contract I was not going to be able to go home for Christmas and I was all the way across the state and I was feeling kind of sad I was 20 years old and I'd been very sheltered and I wasn't terribly independent at the time and I was feeling sad I mean my my sister-in-law had her all of her sisters there and their families and their kids and you know she had her father and mother there at the time and her father saw that I was sitting on the edge of the couch and was probably looking pretty sad because I have a very expressive face especially towards things like sadness or in grumpiness and he came over and started talking to me and asking me about my family's traditions. What did we have? What did we, what did we eat on for Christmas? And were there special dishes I liked? And um, 
did we have our Christmas dinner on Christmas Eve or did we do it Christmas Day? And he slowly drew me out. And these people at the time were strangers to me. And he drew me out and asked me if I liked things like oysters, and I did. And he brought two ingredients, he brought two dishes to that particular Christmas. He brought Waldorf salad, which I have shared the recipe with you all. And he also brought his oyster stuffing and tried, and I tried it for the first time and loved it. Roger was a really, he was a good cook with the things that he cooked, and he was such a kind man. He had four daughters, so I guess I shouldn't be surprised that he reached out to a kind of lonely and sad girl on Christmas and helped her feel like home. But that's what the uh, that's what the recipes are for. That's why I started cooking, and that's why I wrote the cookbook that I wrote, and I'm still editing, <laughs> so that we had kind of a time capsule in food of family members and times and friends that we could pass on through generations. Um, Andrew and I don't have children. We didn't want them. But I kind of hope that my recipes will get shared with my nieces and nephews and hopefully their children someday. And on down the line, well, they'll remember Aunt Karen and they'll remember Grandpa Roger and they'll remember their own parents through recipes that they loved and shared at special times. So that's kind of my goal and why I did cooking and why I'm doing my cooking stream cooking with hedge pigs. And I think the casseroles are probably almost done because I've been babbling on long enough. And I hope that you can take my recipes and enjoy them and adapt them to yourself and share them. You have my total and utter permission to, if you cook a recipe and you have your friends there, if you take it to a potluck or a office party, whatever it is you're doing, if someone asks you for the recipe, by all means, give them my recipe with my compliments. And we've got two minutes left on the casseroles, and then they'll come out, and I will plate up these lovely things for you, and you can see what they, what they look like, and my husband can tell me through you, or possibly his own typing, uh, what these recipes taste like. So, I have got our two presentation plates here. Uh, hmm. I probably need something like a hot pad or a towel. Oh, he's going to bring it out on a, on a cutting board. Even better. And it's coming out of the oven now. And there we go. Here is the finished casserole. Ooh, hot. And it has got a little bit of a toast on top. And I am going to put this. I took away my scoop. I'll just use the pasta fork. I'm going to take some of this out of here, and you see that there, put it on the plate, and it's nice and creamy, it's steamy, it's got the 
It's got the almonds on top. And the mushrooms throughout. Let me skim a little bit of the almonds and stuff off the top to make it look nice and pretty. And there's the pretty plate for you all. And you can get a nice picture of that. Spoon up some more for me. Good. And my husband can go in the other room and type what he thinks of this into stream. That's for, that's for my dad, hopefully. But here we have it, another nice serving. As you can see, it's got a lot going on there. And I am going to take a little bit of this and taste it with a spoon. And give you my own thoughts. Hopefully, my husband will type up his. And <laughs> mm. the chicken is tender and moist. The mushrooms aren't, well, they're not mushy. Uh, but they are softened and cooked through. The celery still has a tiniest bit of a crunch to it. <coughs> so. Sorry, I choked on air. Yeah, we're both doing it now. The pasta is cooked just al dente. It's not overcooked and mushy. You can feel the textures of everything you're eating. And you can taste the mushrooms. And the chicken gravy. And the herbs I put in it so you can taste the sage and the parsley. This is definitely a keeper recipe if you like chicken dishes. Now, I'm going to tell you all thank you, especially as this is one of my longer streams I've ever done. Thank you all for coming. And we will see you on Tuesday where I will be making... I will be making uh, stuffed... Pardon me. I'll be making cottage pie. And we're going to go raid the AFK kitchen where Kathy is doing her usual wonderful job of raising money for the kids in a local children's hospital to make their lives a little more bearable. And everything she gets through the stream is for charity. She feeds 50 people a week at a soup kitchen nearby and she's just a lovely person and fabulous entertainment of a more adult type um the language is a bit blue but that's part of her charm anyway we will see you again and thank you so much for coming i hope you enjoy this recipe and let's go raid the afk kitchen